right, well, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, fall workshop from the uh, NWS Flyers. Glad you could join us tonight. Uh, tonight, we're gonna do something a little bit different than what we have in the previous two workshops. Um, in the previous two workshops, we kind of talked about seasonal aviation hazards, uh, kind of from a broad perspective. Uh, tonight, we're going to kind of channel our focus a little bit more on a particular hazard, one that's very uh, costly and uh, unfortunately deadly at times, um, and that being, uh, IFR potential and the, uh, the ways to, to mitigate that, ways to be aware of that. And uh, we wanted to take a little bit deeper dive into one topic versus uh, kind of a broad overview of many. So we've got uh, several presenters tonight uh, that's going to be uh, sharing some information with us. Uh, Paul Suffern, he is a meteorologist with the NTSB. He's got a, a good case for us that uh, he's gonna be walk, walking through. Uh, we'll, we'll kick it off with him and turn it over to uh, Mark Bukowski. Uh, he's the chief flight instructor and a recent uh, recipient of the WRN Ambassador of Excellence Award. And uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about whether the Ready Weather Ready Nation program and how you can become a part of that if you're interested. Uh, and then we've got uh, a few presenters from the NWS Flyers, uh, and they'll be talking about some uh, fog potential uh, forecasting and avoidance methods and how you can be aware of, uh, of those hazards. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to chat those in the uh, GoToWebinar GUI, and we'll uh, we'll you know kind of collect those and, and answer those at the end uh, with with any of the presenters as we as we go through. So, Paul, I'm going to, to turn it over to you, and we'll we'll get started. Thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Screen is shared. Is it popping up okay for everybody? Yeah, we see it, Paul. We're good to go. Okay, great. Well, I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to come to this event and just share some um, some accident uh, examples and, and things like that that have been weather related uh, that, that have definitely highlighted some issues with instrument meteorological conditions or, or IMC. Um, the perspective that, that I'll be taking, so I'm a meteorologist with the NTSB. We have three meteorologists uh, that work there. Um, and so a lot of my accident examples will be uh, showing and highlighting uh, particular weather areas. Um, but as with any investigation, there's definitely a human factor side. Uh, there's an operation side, air traffic uh, frequently, and and lots of different other reports. And so I'm going to be sharing kind of a weather piece and, and a little bit from the pilot side. Um, but as I'm going through my accident examples, I definitely want to um, highlight the areas where um, pilots can can see themselves going through these scenarios and ways to to mitigate those things. And I don't want to in any way, shape, or form, disparage any of the pilots that got into these accidents. Um, you know, any of these scenarios could could be one of us as well. And so, um, just making sure to to stay safe uh, in in many different aspects. And so, um, so I'll kind of step through some scenarios and then and push it along to to the other presenters because I know they have some great material as well. Um, so one of the, the biggest things that, that we see from our weather-related accidents at the NTSB, and over, over the course of the year, it's about 25 to 30 percent of our accidents are weather-related. Um, as you can see from the graph on this screen, most of those weather-related accidents are wind uh, and typically are not fatal, thankfully, um, but that's landing with a tailwind, a crosswind, uh, you know, gusty winds, things like that. But if we go down to, to ceiling visibility and precipitation, where you see that the fatal rate goes up quite a bit and light condition, and that's where we're dealing with visual flight rules or VFR and to, to IMC, or even sometimes um, you know, IFR qualified pilots um, that, that may not be current and things like that. Um, but you'll you'll be doing a cross country and then all of a sudden you'll be doing it, you know, done it 30 times in the daytime and this first time you've done it at night or near sunset or sunrise and then, you know, some low, cl low clouds form or some fog or things like that. Uh, so those are kind of some of the scenarios. And as you'll see in the accident examples I, I have today, unfortunately, it's it's typically not just one weather related um, issue that, that gets 
uh, pilots and, and others in the trouble. It's it's IMC and then you throw in ice or you throw in precipitation or, or many things like that. And so I'll step through these uh, different scenarios here. Um, this first one uh, happened in Texas uh, near near uh, Houston area, Katy, Texas. Uh, it was a VFR uh, flight following flight part 91. It was going from El Paso to, to Houston to an airport just west of Houston there. Um, and the, the pilot and a passenger had uh, had actually delayed their, their trip, their VFR cross-country flight, uh, a couple of days to get a better weather window, um, but they departed from the West Coast, uh, landed in El Paso the, the day before, and then were planning to move on to, to Houston. Uh, the pilot in this particular case had just around 250 hours or so. Uh, did get a, a weather briefing from Lido's flight service there, and, and through that course of conversation was, was um, provided a lot of, of weather material um, and uh, there was some precipitation in the Houston area as well as air mets and, and several other things and, and therefore the Lido's uh, flight service person said you know VFR is not recommended. Uh, unfortunately led to, to the fatality of the pilot in this case and as you can see on the bottom of the screen I have the METAR for the closest uh, site to the accident site and you can see about two and a half miles light rain and, and overcast at 900. Um, the temperature and dew point is is definitely something to note as well as they were they were very similar there at 14, um, so very moist uh, there in the Houston area. Um, so here's kind of a an overview chart of the the Texas region and and Southern Plains. Um, the station uh, models are the circles with the little wind barbs out there, and then you can see areas where there there's rain uh, highlighted with the accident area, which is circled in red. The general flight path there is the red da or the uh, black dashed line from uh, northwest to southeast, uh, going from El Paso area down in into Houston area. There's a little bit of a trough um, there, or an area of kind of a, a little weakness or low pressure uh, down in, in the southern Texas area, which was helping is very conducive uh, for cloud cover and precipitation, and that was slowly moving northeastward throughout the day. So in this particular case, the uh, the pilot received weather briefing close to noon uh, on the day of the accident, discussing the the air mets over the area, uh, with the precipitation was, was south of Houston at the time of the briefing, but was forecast to move northeastward. Uh, and the briefer told uh, VFR not recommended based on the air med as well as the Sugarland TAF, uh, which is the closest airport with a a terminal aerodrome forecast or a TAF. Uh, it did have ceilings going from marginal of VFR, so between about a thousand to three thousand feet uh, down below a thousand feet. And the pilot uh, on, on uh, with Lidos there was saying they would check precipitation trends and get an update once they were in flight. And uh, Unfortunately, after they encountered the clouds and, and precipitation as they got closer to Houston, uh, they, their uh, turns uh, became quite a bit more erratic uh, and appear to be a little bit more spatially disoriented. Um, and this graphic is kind of the, the last few minutes of the flight. You can see over on the left middle part of the screen is the, the uh, proposed airport that the, the pilot was going to. Uh, you can see they overflew the airport, I believe, between about two and three thousand feet or so, and you can see the flight track is is definitely um, not not a very constant, definitely erratic. And as they were making that northward turn, they uh, uh, they hit some cabling uh, and a tower there as they were going northward. Um, here's a, a visible satellite animation, and and hopefully um, with uh, the bandwidth is coming across okay, but you can see. Uh, quite a bit of, of, you know, it's nice flying weather there in, in central and west Texas up to the Panhandle area, but down across Houston and in central and southeastern Texas, you can see quite a bit more cloud cover. You can kind of, um, as you're looping it, you can see two distinct areas of cloud cover. You can kind of see the lower cloud cover, which seems a little bit more flat and, and up in Oklahoma has a few waves in it. Um, but over the Houston area, you can see uh, definitely a little bit more bubbly um, and uh, cumulus clouds. So definitely a lot more vertical development cloud tops this particular day were between 30 and 40,000 feet or so. Um, so quite quite extensive precipitation moving across the area and this is one of the things i definitely want to highlight uh, to to the pilots out there is when you're looking at imagery whether it's uh, satellite or radar or 
or anything, please, please absolutely loop it. Um, if you're just looking at one static image, it's not going to necessarily tell you the full picture of, of where that cloud cover is moving, how that fog is dissipating, or how it's uh, maybe increasing over the area, things like that. So looping imagery uh, is definitely very helpful. So uh, this following images and a series of images kind of show the flight track, which is in pink as it's moving east southeastward. Um, the, the black circle is the accident site, and then I'll step through different locations. Um, if you look at the flight track, you know, from uh, this about uh, 350 or so, and then to the northwest, you can see it's a much more consistent flight track, and this was the case all the way uh, from El Paso. But uh, from, you know, this 350 uh, time location and, and all the way to the accident site, you can see the flight track becomes quite a bit more erratic as they're encountering precipitation and, and cloud cover descending through that, that cloud cover as they're approaching the airport. So here's 55 or five minutes before the hour. Here's right at four o'clock. And then they go uh, across the airport uh, between four and, and four. 405 and then fortunately encounter that. So here's a, a few or an image of the uh, the warning level of products that were out there. So you had a center weather advisory for low IFR conditions kind of in central Texas in a, in a convective SIGMET in that area moving northeastward. I do not have highlighted but is definitely there with there was an air met out for uh, the low IFR conditions and these little circles on there um, are station models uh, just highlighting the flight category so red being IFR uh, so below uh, three miles and a thousand feet and then the purple being um, low IFR, so below 500 in a mile or so. And you can see quite a num uh, numerous pyreps uh, throughout the area um, highlighting those cloud cover conditions if, if you clicked on those as well. So here's a, a loop of the imagery, and as you can see, um, you know, the, the flight track is definitely encountering the precipitation. The, the band is not moving northward all that quickly, and so... Um, it's, it's just mainly heading from, from west to east with the precipitation. So making sure and, and preparing as, as you're flying out there where you pick your alternate, if you're uh, flying VFR and things like that, you know, uh, picking an area to, to the north uh, would have avoided the precipitation in this particular case. And, and unfortunately, uh, here's a picture of the wreckage there as we went out on scene and had the probable cause in this particular case was the non-instrument related pilot's uh, decision uh, to continue in the visual flight rules, encountered the IMC and unfortunately uh, had the, the loss of control with spatial disorientation. So I wanna highlight uh, another uh, example of, of similar conditions here. So that last example had cloud cover and a little bit of precipitation. Uh, this one has a, has a combination of factors as well as a flight uh, from uh, Fort Collins area, so kind of central and, and northeastern Colorado, heading to Moab, Utah uh, for a family vacation, meeting another family. Uh, the pilot had about 300 hours or so of flight time and did flight following as well. Um, typically would check the weather uh, according to, to the uh, uh, flight instructor that uh, this pilot had. Uh, but in this ca particular case, the, the pilot uh, was running behind. He had planned to leave much earlier in the day and, and had to stay late at work and things like that, and unfortunately led to, to four fatalities. Uh, here's the, the METAR closest to the accident site, but rifle is pretty much in a valley. And so you can see that the, the broken ceiling and cloud covers and things like that is much higher in the terrain, so at 7,000 feet above uh, the airport. But there is, a, in the remarks section, there's lightning distant to the south, which highlights uh, you know, one of the hazards that they're flying through. So on this day, there was a low pressure center uh, over the uh, central Colorado area is moving from west to east. Um, and here's kind of uh, all the different uh, AWOS and ASOS or official reporting station sites around the accident site, which is highlighted in the star. And, and the, the first METAR that I showed there is from rifles to the west southwest, but actually closer to the altitude that this pilot was going, which was between 10 and 13,000 feet. Uh, there's actually a, a site up on top of one of the mountains around uh, 10 or 10,500 to 11,000 feet. And you can see from there at that altitude, it was about a mile visibility, light rain, overcast 200 ceilings, and then uh, gusty winds to, to 24 knots or so, and also mentioned the lightning distance there as well. So much closer to the altitude that the, this flight was going at and to avoid the, the terrain there as well. So here's the, the flight track. Uh, from 
uh, northeast to southwest, so heading in toward, uh, toward Utah and the area. They, they um, travel uh, down about three quarters or a portion of the flight before encountering precipitation. And then you can see the, the uh, altitudes and things like that definitely start to change quite a bit more. So the flight left about 7.20. They were planning to leave about 2 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, had a flight following service there and, and was going to go about 15,000 feet to get over the mountains and then they get back down there across the terrain. Um, headed direct uh, to, um, to the VOR there and was basically between about 10,500 and 11,000 feet uh, for the majority of the flight till about 730, 740 or so. But then uh, the altitude starts to, to change quite a bit, going up to as high as about 13,000 feet and down to about 10,500. But it was very variable uh, going across the, the mountainous terrain. And, and there are definitely some weather considerations as we move through there. Um, one of the passengers actually sent a, sent a text message uh, uh, back to, to the, the mother who, who was on the ground there saying uh, they were trying to avoid the weather uh, conditions. Um, so here's a, another summary chart of this particular uh, sequence here uh, showing they, they encounter the precipitation between about 750 and 745. Um, so the, the pink dots being the flight track going to the uh, uh, west southwest or so. Um, and they can, uh, they're in and out of the precipitation. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the freezing level was around 11,000 feet or 11,500 feet on this particular case as well. Um, but it appears that right around 8, they, they do break out of some precipitation, but then encounter more cloud cover as they're heading northwest bound in another uh, patch of precipitation. And um, unfortunately, that's, that's where the accident site had. Um, so I did want to highlight, and I, I apologize, um, uh, in advance for, for uh, using this, this graphic here, but it definitely shows quite a bit of information on, on one chart. And there's a lot of good uh, resources out there, including a Aviation Weather Center, AOPA have a lot of resources on upper air soundings and how that information can be extremely valuable. Basically, to, to summarize, that's basically letting uh, releasing a balloon from the ground all the way up to wherever it pops, 40, 50, 60, 100,000 feet, and you get temperature, moisture, wind information. And you can tell a lot from there. Uh, uh, where fog will form, low clouds, and things like that. And so on this particular diagram here from the accident site, uh, we were able to, to model and show the, the red line being the temperature line, the dashed line being the moisture. And when they're close together, uh, that's where you'll see cloud cover uh, quite a bit of the time. You can highlight the freezing level uh, and things like that and, and potential for icing. Um, so, and there was actually quite a bit of wind over the terrain there as well. And anytime you get near terrain, uh, even low-level terrain, you could have potentially encounter mountain wave conditions as well. So uh, uh, quite a bit of forecast for, for mountain obscuration. There was a convective sigmet out because a few of the uh, rain shower cells actually were, were a little bit more conducive and actually uh, did turn into full-on uh, thunderstorm activity. Um, and this was highlighted there. Uh, across the region and, and that area was moving from west to east with that low pressure center, as you saw. Um, a few of the icing products that, that were out there did highlight the potential uh, for likely icing conditions. Uh, and so an area that, that the pilot was likely trying to trying to avoid there at 13 to 12,000 feet, but just so much terrain there in Colorado makes it difficult. Uh, and so um, here's a, a few pictures of, of the accident site in this particular case there as well. Um, and I did want to highlight again that as you're flying through cloud cover, in this case, there was not only precipitation, but icing considerations there as well. So again, it's typically not just one uh, different scenario uh, as, as pilots are encountering these weather hazards. So we had the uh, probable cause being the non-instrument rated pilots uh, flight into the IMC conditions there, got spatially disoriented as, as well, and, and, and unfortunately lost control of the airplane. So I do want to highlight a number of things, and I'm sure the other presenters will, will talk on this. And, and a lot of times in, in several scenarios in accidents, especially VFR and IMC ones, we'll have pilots that will just check the, the weather at the departure and destination and forget that the weather happens in the middle. Um, again, it happened uh, taking off at sunrise and sunset, uh, you know, peak times where, where moisture can pool a little bit together. If there are light winds, you can see fog or low clouds form and things like that. Also, when are the forecasts issued? You know, some of the uh, forecasts are issued every 
uh, one hour, every three hours, every six hours, and things like that. And so knowing when the next product's going to, to come out might might be behoove uh, you as a pilot to, to delay a little bit uh, just to make sure to get the newest forecast out there. And then what's in the surrounding area? Uh, again, making a decision of, of where to, to pick a, an alternate location to, to land if you get into some unfortunate weather issues is, is extremely important. I can't stress enough um, just practicing doing that every time you go out and fly on, on clear weather days, uh, just running through those those routines because then when you unfortunately encounter weather, that'll, that'll be built in there as well. Um, so I know the, the first two scenarios I kind of highlighted and showed, um, you may not think, oh, well, I'm, I'm a pilot, I have way more than 300 or, or 200 hours of flight time. Um, but unfortunately, VFR and IMC uh, conditions uh, do, do um, uh, encounter even high time pilots and, and cause issues, as you'll see in this example, is the IFR flight from Central Florida up to Cairo, Georgia, which is kind of Southern Georgia area. They're flying IFR. The commercially rated pilot had over a thousand hours, and then had a passenger who had, um, you know, between nine and ten thousand hours. Was very comfortable flying at low altitudes because they were comfortable with with uh, flying actually helicopters and and flying below cloud cover and that. And they received a weather briefing talking about the low ceilings and visibilities there in, in northern Florida and southern Georgia, and unfortunately led to to the two fatalities in this case. And you can see the closest METAR here with three miles in mist and overcast at, at 400. And again, the temperature and dew point are, are very close together there as well. Um, so here's kind of a, a brief overview of uh, you know the weather across the southeastern United States right around the accident time. The flight path being from Lakeland just in general is, is following that northwestward track on the, the black dash lines. Um, you can see a frontal boundary there uh, draped across the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, warm front. Uh, the station models, the, the circles are not filled in uh, south of the warm front, so indicating you know mostly clear, partly cloudy skies and, and things like that, much warmer down there. But once you go into Alabama and Georgia, South Carolina, and even Mississippi area, you can see all the circles are filled in. Um, so extensive cloud cover across that area, the, the two dash lines in pink there indicating a mist and there was fog and there was actually some precipitation up uh, in um, northeastern Georgia and, and South Carolina as well. So much lower cloud cover once you go north of the a warm front boundary. Um, here's a, a brief outline of, of the flight track. Uh, as they're heading northwest bound, uh, you can see a pretty consistent flight track up to the northwest and then um, becomes quite a bit more erratic. And, and I'll explain uh, that as we go through the scenario here. Uh, they got their weather briefing about 8.30 or so, talking about the the uh, Center Weather Service Advisory for the low IFR conditions. There was a SIGMET for a thunderstorm activity in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, but that was forecast to stay um, just out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the briefer told the, the pilot's pretty bad out there, and they, they said they'd wait about an hour or two uh, before taking off, but they departed about 30 minutes later or so. Um, they did report uh, having the uh, the airport in sight about 30 miles out, um, but based on witness observations and what we're able to pull from satellite, that, that likely uh, was not the case. Um, but they did cancel IFR at that time, and that's where the flight track became quite a bit more erratic. Uh, in altitude and in, in uh, direction there. And they did were able to reestablish with air traffic control, but at that point uh, they were never able to, to get uh, the flight uh, less erratic and, and unfortunately ran into another pocket of weather as well. And, and I'll go into that. So there's abundant uh, uh, rain across, uh, mainly stationed in the um, northeastern Gulf of Mexico and along the west coast of Florida and they did avoid quite a bit of the precipitation and here's kind of a, a highlight scenario of all the forecast uh, products that were out on this particular uh, day. The, uh, the darker colors indicate areas where there were um, Center Weather Service advisories highlighting the low IFR or all the pink circles there and IFR being all the red circles so you can see it's a, a you know basically the whole southeast is at least IFR. Uh, and then air mets out for that, and a, a few higher um, uh, air mets for, for icing conditions and the higher cloud cover there as well. And that stayed pretty consistent throughout the, the morning and, and throughout the accident timeframe here as well. So here's, the, here's another summary uh, 
flight track with weather radar. You can see they avoided the precipitation as they head from, from Lakeland all the way up to, to northern Florida. And they, they were in contact with the, the TRACON over there at Tallahassee and, and said they were still IMC at this particular point about you know a third of the way up the flight track. And then they cancel IFR saying they have the airport in sight. And I don't know if my mouse really shows up uh, on this screen here, but up in the upper left-hand corner where um, that's the airport that they were going to. Um, but based on the uh, satellite imagery we had available at the time, as well as a witness observation, the, the, per the passenger they were going to pick up took this picture at the exact time they canceled IFR. This is uh, looking south. It was raining and, and quite a, a bit of low cloud cover pointing in that direction. So it's unlikely that they did have the airport in sight based on that and what our research and engineering folks were able to, to calculate there as well. Um, the uh, flight became a little bit more erratic uh, there. They were able to uh, reestablish with, with Trake on there and head westbound, but unfortunately, uh, that's uh, as they were turning back east to, to, make an, uh, to make an approach into the airport, they encountered a building rain shower, as you can see highlighted by this um, uh, this weather radar loop there as well. And unfortunately, they, they were relatively low to the ground. And so uh, when that happened, things became uh, quite a bit turbulent. And that's where it led to the loss of control here. And here's uh, some pictures of the accident scene here. So the, the probable cause in this case was the, the loss of control due to spatial disorientation. In addition, the Pilot did have uh, multiple medications and drugs in their system as well, which uh, potentially did lead to to some degradation of uh, decision making while in, in those weather conditions there. So I wanted to highlight a, a few more things and, and I'll hand off to the next presenter, but uh, AOP Day does a, a great weather survey and it's been very helpful for us to kind of understand trends of what pilots are using. Um, and here's kind of a highlight area over the last uh, five or six years. Uh, and we know folks are calling flight service and, and lead us less, and they're using aviation apps more, as you can see from the, the uh, left side of the screen, uh, mainly due to the graphics and things like that. And, and I totally understand it. It's, much, it's, it's user friendly on the graphics and, and things there. It's, it's very helpful. Um, but one of the things I do want to stress, and this is the initial weather briefing and then immediately prior to flight, uh, folks are getting on their XM weather or FISB weather and things like that, is make sure as you're doing your weather briefing uh, that you do um, talk to a weather briefer or if you're not able to do that, talk to somebody who's experienced in the potential weather conditions that you're gonna fly in and uh, bounce your, your weather ideas off of them. Uh, we know folks are using aviation apps and, and things, but making sure that you're at least selecting um, something on your app that a that a forecaster has touched or a human being has touched is extremely important. Don't just use uh, weather apps and things out there that are just weather computer model data. And I know uh, the folks that will present today can definitely highlight areas where where that could be. Um, but things like air mets and center weather advisories are, are folks that are touched by human beings that are going out there and, and using their expertise and, and highlighting where, where um, pilots should be con more concerned about the weather there. And so uh, please, as, as you're briefing yourself on your weather conditions and things like that, uh, make sure that you're at least looking at, at one weather forecast product that a human being has touched and not just all the... Um, all the uh, fancier looking computer model data, because uh, that, that may lead you down a wrong path, unfortunately. Um, so, and yeah, I just wanted to highlight things about ForeFlight and other apps. A, a lot of them, you know, do step through um, the uh, standard weather information, which is some, some great tools in there. And a lot of those will have, you know, air mats and, and those conditions in there. But some of the resources on, I'm not just picking on for flight, but there's quite a few other out there just use weather computer model data. And so knowing which ones are those and the pitfalls of those uh, can definitely be highlighted uh, here today on the call or also talking to somebody who's experienced uh, using those those weather apps. So, so please make sure you, you talk to that. And Definitely uh, saw this. This was a study that was done by NASA, and I know it's a lot of numbers and a lot of percent signs and and tables and things like that. And it's getting to the evening, and and folks are um, uh, don't want to put too much math on everybody. But um, there's a, a very helpful study that talked about VFR local flights, uh, VFR cross country there in the middle, and IFR and wet weather products. A lot of pilots were were checking. You can see radar tafts and METARs. Folks are checking that all the time. 
uh, regardless if they're doing VFR local to IFR. You add winds aloft when you go to cross country and IFR for, for fuel planning and things like that. But there's a lot of um, weather products out there. Unfortunately, uh, quite a few pilots are not checking, uh, which do have the human interaction touch and things like that, like air mets and sig mets. You can see folks are, are checking those only maybe half the time or so. And so building, uh, as you're building through your routine and doing just a VFR local flight, and it's a beautiful VFR day, just practicing those scenarios where, you know, if I get into weather, this would be my alternate and things like that is, is extremely important because uh, you'll build that repetition and things that can keep you safe and further products. And you know, my last uh, slide here, I just want to highlight again, a, a reason to, to talk to, you know, folks out there and not just uh, rely on weather computer model data. So as a pilot, you could be looking and see an air met for mountain obscuration. This was a condition back in 2018 when there was abundant wildfire smoke out there. And so just looking through that scenario, you see sky clear, it's gonna be a beautiful day and things like that. Why in the world do they have an air mat out there? And then you can click on that and that's something that may or may not be highlighted by a weather computer model, but a, a human being forecaster looking at PIREPS and, and all the other formation can, can highlight an area for you know, potential issues with slantwise visibility and things like that. And so with that, here's my email. You can email me or type questions into to the um, chat and uh, happy and looking forward to the rest of the presentations. Uh, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Paul. I'm gonna leave your uh, slide there up for a few more seconds to give people ample time to copy down uh, your information there. Uh, appreciate your presentation. Those are sobering and helpful reminders of, uh, of what can and, and will happen in a given winter weather season. Um, and, and it goes without saying these conditions, uh, VFR and IFR, uh, will form at some point uh, on a given day uh, as just we head into the cold season. Uh, so that's why we're uh, providing the education that we are um, and helping you to, to know where to look for conditions such as these and maybe delay your flight, maybe reschedule, um, maybe pick an alternate airfield, uh, whatever helps you stay safe. Uh, so, so appreciate your time, Paul. Uh, we'll uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Mark Vaguski here. Uh, just uh, two quick reminders. Uh, feel free to uh, field your submit your questions uh, as we as we go. Um, we'll be able to answer some of those uh, via the chat. We'll uh, also uh, have a little bit of time uh, at the end to uh, field any that are unaddressed. Uh, also, this entire presentation is going to be available on YouTube uh, probably tomorrow, starting tomorrow. So. Uh, if you if you don't feel like you know copying down uh, certain slides, uh, those will be available uh, to you at, at any given point on YouTube uh, very soon. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Mark, uh, who has some more helpful information to us. And Mark, the presentation is yours, sir. All right, very good. Thank you. Let's see here. All right, we've got you loud and clear and we see your presentation there. Okay, thank you, Paul. Okay, um, so that was some really good information. And are you hear me okay? Hey, firm, we've got you loud and clear. Okay, good, thank you. So uh, good evening and thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Mark Boguski, and I'm a CFI in Olathe, Kansas, at, and a uh, FAST team representative. And I've been asked to give a pilot's perspective on VFR flight into IMC. You know, as we've seen from Paul's presentation, flight into uh, IMC is one of the most serious situations a GA pilot can face if they're not trained and prepared. And because pilots of all levels can get themselves into trouble, I want to start with a short video that dramatizes the seriousness of uh, VFR into IMC flight. AOPA Air, Air Safety Institute put together this video and frankly, it's terrifying. But it's a powerful reminder of why we need to avoid flight into IMC unless we're trained and prepared. Let's see here.
Yes, the video is not showing. It's still loading. We'll give it we'll give it another few seconds here. Okay. I don't think that video is going on. Yeah, for the sake of time, I guess let's uh, proceed. Uh, it, it was a great video. It's too bad we can't see it, but maybe, maybe we can try again later. Uh, but yeah, for now, let's uh, let's uh, proceed with this. Okay, very okay, good. Very good. Well, well um, um, if you if get, you a, get chance, a chance, go on to the uh, NOPA Air Safety Institute website, and uh, you can see the uh, video, 178 seconds to live. So naturally, the uh, best avoidance technique uh, is to avoid IMC altogether. And unless you're trained in, on an instrument flight plan, you know, flight in the clouds can be perfectly safe if you're prepared for it and if you're following the proper procedures. It's when we push ourselves and our aircraft beyond our capabilities that we get into trouble. What I'd like to talk about tonight is what I'd like, I'd like to, talk to talk about tonight, tonight is, is uh, why do pilots fly into IMC? We'll talk about uh, go, no go decision making, and we'll talk about some personal minimums. And if you do find yourself in IMC or some kind of low visibility situation, what do we do to get out of IMC? How do we fly with reference to instruments? And then also, how do we get ATC assistance? Let's do a quick review, though, of the definition of IFR and VFR. Um, in controlled airspace, IFR conditions are defined as being less than three miles visibility and or 1,000 foot ceilings. And we further designate low IFR conditions as being a mile visibility and or 500 foot ceilings. VFR is designated as greater than three stature miles or a thousand foot ceilings, but that is also designated as marginal VFR. We don't get what we call more safe VFR until we're five stature miles visibility and 3000 foot ceilings. We're gonna try something, I've never tried this before, but uh, we're gonna do a quick poll here. And uh, let's see if, have you experienced flying in IMC? And so, yes, I'm instrument rated. Uh, yes, I'm not instrument rated or no. We'll give it just a couple more seconds. We've got about 75% of people voted.
All right, well, we've got 85% of people watching and voted, and 44% uh, are IFR certified and they have experience IMC flight. 15% uh, have said yes, but they're not IFR certified, and 41% uh, know they have not experienced uh, VFR into IMC. That's interesting. When we're new students, we learn how to gather weather reports and forecasts. And uh, we also, when we fly solo, we fly under strict limitations set by our CFI. They tell us what kind of visibility, clouds, winds, et cetera, that we are able to fly under. Depending on when you learn to fly, there are a host of new tools and resources that have become available to pilots that just weren't available even a few years ago, and they're constantly improving. In fact, I'd say that uh, with new tools like the graphical forecast for aviation and some of the other weather, weather products available from the National Weather Service, as well as products from Flight Service and the EFB products that are available, um, not even to mention some of the smart apps that are on smartphones. We've never had a more complete weather information available to us. And as Paul mentioned, it's highly, rec it's highly uh, um, a good idea to uh, use a, a weather briefer, if at all, when the weather's at all questionable. And we don't have time to discuss all of these uh, various products, but the National Weather Service presentation will follow. We'll uh, show some of those products. One thing is it's really incumbent upon all of us as pilots to continually grow in our meteor meteorological knowledge so that we become safer pilots. In addition to weather training, We've also received training on how to fly in marginal weather conditions by flying under the hood. However, oftentimes we didn't get a chance to fly in the clouds or with marginal weather conditions. Now, I always try to take my students up in the clouds or in poor visibility conditions, but it's not always possible. Sometimes the weather's just too good. Now, the FAA mandates a minimum of three hours of simulated instrument training or flying by reference to instruments for private pilots. And as we all know, if we don't constantly practice these skills, they'll erode quickly. That's why instrument pilots are required to shoot a minimum number of approaches every six months, in addition to practicing other skills. If you can, it'd be great to offer yourself up as a safety pilot for an instrument pilot, and you'll get some good experience in instrument operations and procedures. Once we get our license, however, we're on our own and it's up to us to be making our own weather decisions. Now, I always encourage my former students to call me if they've got any time questions about weather or various go, no go decisions. You know, weather's a very dynamic situation and our decision making also needs to be equally dynamic. It's always a little frustrating when you get out, it's a beautiful day, but by the time you get down to the airport, and pull the plane out of the hangar, and unforecasted clouds move in. Or we find ourselves on a cross country and the clouds were forecast to have been lifted, but they're still persisting there. It's a beautiful day everywhere, except for our intended destination and we have to divert. Or you've been sitting on the ground for the last hour waiting for a front to pass and watching a radar feed on foreplight. And finally, the radar indicates there's an opening, but is there and will it stay open? You know, visibility is still poor, but it's called marginal VFR right now. And this is what the view looked like once the pilot took off. While technically VFR, the flight conditions were still marginal and needed to be watched carefully. Here's another case that a pilot ran into. This is what it's like to be trapped between layers. He sent me this picture while he was out flying and I told him, get the heck out of there. He turned around and 
told me later that within three minutes, the clouds had closed in behind him. You know, any of these situations could lend themselves to a VFR to IMC incident. Let's try one more poll here. Um, why do we as pilots get ourselves into tight weather situations? Is it a lack of weather knowledge, a lack of experience, or a matter of temperament? Think about your own experience in weather-related situations, and let's hear what you think. All right, we've got about 75% of people voted. We'll just open it, keep it open for a couple more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll. And that's pretty fascinating. Um, roughly, roughly a third, a third, a third or so, but 28%. Uh, consider a lack of weather knowledge, 34% lack of real world experience, and 38% saying, you know, the temperament or our attitude towards flying into IMC. So thanks for that. Uh, thanks for your input there. And so why do pilots fly into IMC? Well, Reality is, is that pilots get themselves into trouble for a variety of reasons, depending upon their level of experience. And we've seen evidence of very experienced pilots getting into VFR and to IMC accidents. You know, most recently think of like the Kobe Bryant helicopter crash where they had a very experienced pilot. We've also seen notable cases where a non-instrument rated pilot gets into a low visibility situation with disastrous results. I always think of the JFK Jr. accident off of Martha's Vineyard. You know, there are many more examples, some that Paul just showed us, but I mention these because they're both widely known. In both these cases, the pilots knew they were going from VFR conditions into a low visibility environment. They had the opportunity to turn around but they made the decision to press forward. We as pilots in command need to constantly evaluate our own attitudes and psychological factors affecting us for continuing a flight when things are going into poor weather. You know, there are numerous case studies available on the AOPA Air Safety Institute website, and I'd encourage you to watch some of these and give some thoughts to how these accidents can be prevented. Now, let's talk about go no go decisions now. As we said from the beginning, the best way to avoid these accidents is to avoid IMC. And so how do we go about that? You know, the process for evaluating weather should start days before we actually make a flight. You look at the trends, look at the big picture, and start big on a national or regional scale, depending on how far you're flying. And ask yourself, You know, is there any hazardous or challenging weather along the route? What weather is expected at my ETA? And what direction would I go if I were to get into IMC and how would I find good VFR conditions? And could I leave sooner or delay my departure? Or could I go partway, land, and wait until the weather improves? Go ahead and get the big picture. You know, we talked about all the different resources that are available now, but uh, some of the best times it's good just to look local weather or the weather channel, something like that, and get an overall picture of what's going on. 
uh, aviationweather.gov uh, can't speak highly enough about the uh, graphical forecast for aviation tool, but that's uh, just a fantastic tool for going through and getting an, an overview and probing down into what the weather is. If you decide to go, then it's time to get a more detailed briefing. And I still use flight service weather briefers a lot. Um, I like talking to a real person. You can also self-brief using the flight service website or one of the EFBs uh, that record the fact that you've gotten a briefing. And in that briefing, you're going to get TFRs, airmets, SIGMETs. You'll get the weather across the route. Be able to look at radar, cloud bases, winds aloft, speed and direction of frontal movement. And so all of those are important things that go into that. If based on all that, you decide it's a go, so what's the next step? While we're en route, make sure you're ch constantly checking the weather. You can talk to flight service on 122.2 generally or on a nearby VOR frequency. We've got ADSB and you can check AWOSs, ASOSs, you know, and ATIS along the route of flight. Based on that information, do you continue or do you divert? And the main thing is make sure you always have an out. And if you've got passengers with you, make your passengers part of the decision-making process. And there's a video that Rob Machado put together uh, on VFR to IMC. And I love the way Rob Machado takes an introspective look into the psychology of pilots. Rob makes an excellent point that there are generally two reasons why pilots press on into bad weather. First, pilots are very goal-oriented, and once we begin a task, we generally do whatever it takes to complete it, particularly if there are negative consequences for not completing it, such as spending an unplanned night at a deserted airport or missing that football game that we were flying to. And I would venture that most of the time when we launch on a cross country, there's probably a pressing reason in our mind that we really should complete that trip. This is the classic case of get their itis. And secondly, if we have passengers who want to get to a destination or people waiting for us to, at the destination, we don't want to disappoint them. And this is a great strategy that Rob, Rod suggests. Make your passengers part of the decision-making process. Before you depart, Ask them if there's any reason that any one of them would be unwilling to divert, turn around, or cancel the flight. Well, generally, they're all going to say, oh, no, we want to be safe. Because we all know that it's much easier to cancel before we leave if the weather's looking bad than if we're halfway there and we have to make a decision to divert. Classic case of external pressures that we all know from the PAVE checklist, right? By asking your passengers that question up front, now you've made them invested in the decision to fly safely. One of the things we all have to remember is that weather forecasts are just that, they're forecasts. And while our ability to forecast weather has improved dramatically over the last few years, they're still forecasts. And as I said earlier, Weather is dynamic, and your decision-making needs to be equally dynamic. So I want to take a quick look at a uh, weather scenario, give you a chance to make a go or no-go decision. Um, let's look at making a VFR flight from Olathe New Century Airport to Branson, Missouri, to enjoy some Christmas festivities with the kids. We'll, we're going to be departing today at 4 p.m., and the flight should take us about one hour and 37 minutes. Here's our route of flight. And the, uh, the weather symbols are a little hard to see in this view. This is from the graphical forecast for aviation. So if I click on the various airports, we can bring up the textual tasks. This might be a little bit easier for you to see. So I'm going to give you just a second to look at those tasks. and give you a chance to uh,
do another poll. So I also uh, put up this, the prog chart here to give you another view. So let's open up the poll. And what would your decision be? Go or no go, given the weather that you see there? I think we're being pretty consistent here so far throughout the poll. We've got about 70% of the people voted. Just a couple more seconds. All right, why don't we go ahead and close the poll down. And that's pretty comforting. 82% of the people thought that's a no-go situation. There's always one other option uh, that we didn't put up here though, but is do you need more information? You know, given look at the tasks and looking at the uh, uh, prog chart, I thought it was pretty clear that the weather looked pretty dreadful there that um, for that flight going in this evening. I want to talk a minute about uh, some of the tools that we have, uh, and one of them is the uh, personal minimums worksheet, and this is available on uh, FAA, uh, I think safety.gov, but I like this tool because it focuses on what skills you have available through your training, your experience, and your currency and proficiency, and then what skills are needed for a specific flight. And so this uh, worksheet allows you to go through, evaluate where you are in your flying career, and uh, it's a good idea to talk it over with your CFI and then make decisions on when and when you won't fly. And the real question is, okay, once you fill this out, how hard will you stick to it? And that's something that you, uh, I always advise to talk with your spouse or your CFI and say, okay, here's my copy of my uh, personal minimums worksheet, and this is when I'm not going to fly. It gives you a chance to uh, have someone else kind of back you up on that decision. If we do find ourselves in the soup, what are the steps we need to take? Well, first of all, you need to expect a very high stress level. And the situation probably didn't happen suddenly, you know, though it can, but more than likely you've been flying along through diminishing visibility or lowering ceilings and starting to get agitated and concerned, you know, if not downright panicked. The key is to maintain situational awareness and control the airplane. Recognize and accept the situation for what it is. It's an emergency. Maintain control of the plane and trust your instruments. And especially if you're not current on instruments, as soon as you can maintain level flight, contact ATC, declare an emergency and request assistance. Now, if you know the frequencies for ATC in your particular area, you, know, you can contact them directly. And if you're not sure, you can contact them on 121.5 and Squawk 7700 on your transponder. An ATC can help by alerting you if you're not flying or a heading or maintaining altitude and can give you vectors to VFR conditions. Now remember, ATC can't see clouds on the radar, but they can, they can only see precipitation but they can look at METARs and you know, have other information from other flights and suggest areas that are in VFR conditions. You 
maintaining control of our planes, you need to trust your instruments. And so make sure the airplane is trimmed for level flight and your power is set for normal cruise power settings. You know, as part of your primary training, you've had a minimum of three hours of flight by reference to instruments and, and hopefully more than that after you, uh, you know, got your certificate. And while that training was not intended to make you proficient in instrument flight, it was intended to help you maintain control of the airplane by flying with your instruments. If you haven't flown under the hood recently, you know, these skills will quickly erode and it's a good idea to go practice them often with a safety pilot or a CFI. You know, the primary instrument that you'll need to rely on is your attitude indicator. You know, trim the plane for fingertip control, you know, avoid having a death grip on the yoke. It's very hard to uh, maintain uh, small movements if you've got a death grip and don't over control the plane. Any attitude changes must be small and smooth. If you've got an autopilot or a wing leveler, turn that on and help that use that to help you maintain straight and level flight. And the four basic maneuvers in an airplane are straight and level, turns, climbs, and descents. And I'd suggest practicing these four basic maneuvers under the hood with your CFI if you haven't done them lately. If you were to get into IMC, after establishing control of the airplane, you'll be using these maneuvers to get yourself out of the clouds and hopefully with the assistance of ATC. You know, if possible, a 180 degree turn may be all that's needed to get you back into VFR conditions, but you'll have to evaluate your particular situation. You know, it may be that a climb or descent will be the right course of action. And ATC can be a great assistance to help you, you know, once you've got the plane stabilized, make sure you use every tool that you've got to help yourself get yourself back into visual conditions. Well, we've talked about why pilots get themselves into trouble and a little bit about how to get yourself out. And I'd like to direct you to some resources that could be really helpful. Uh, one is AOPA.org. The Air Safety Institute has some very good training videos on a VFR flight into IMC. Another resource we've got is FAAsafety.gov and the WINGS program. Uh, they've got a lot of resources and a lot of seminars there. You know, there's numerous commercial sites for training and for uh, advice, and so you know, avail yourself of those. And most importantly, get with your CFI and uh, you know, go out there and get proficient. That's the main thing to help you become a safer and, and uh, more competent pilot. And with that, uh, turn it back over and thank you very much for listening. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. It was a great presentation. Appreciate your time tonight. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, submit those on the on the dashboard there. Uh, we've already got some, some great questions and uh, we'll continue to field those as we go. Uh, so we'll now transition to uh, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of, of IFR conditions from a weather standpoint. Um, we've got uh, three presenters from the uh, NWS Flyers team uh, who'll be going through some uh, various topics tonight. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up and uh, should, be, should be able to uh, finish up within the next hour or so, um, 30 minutes to an hour. So uh, we'll start it off with uh, Jeremiah. He's a meteorologist at AWC and uh, he's going to be talking about some temperature and dew point basics. Uh, let me give you control uh, very quickly here, Jeremiah. All right, it is yours. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Jeremiah Pyle, and I'm a forecaster with the Aviation Weather Center. I've been here for about two years now, and I have past experience for about 10 years working in local forecast offices in Portland, Oregon, and Boston, Massachusetts. So I've got a lot of different aviation forecasting experience at this point, both at the local level and nationally. And and, uh, so I, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about a few of the important um, definitions that, that we need to know in order to understand fog and low stratus formation. Um, before I go into that, let's first just define fog 
what is what is fog? I mean, I think everyone has a pretty intuitive sense, but basically it's just a cloud at the ground surface. So a cloud of tiny water droplets suspended in the atmosphere near the ground surface. And depending on what part of the country you live in, fog is going to be more or less of a concern for aviation. So for instance, where I came from in, up in the Pacific Northwest, fog is a very frequent occurrence and often very dense fog. And up in the Northeast and the Appalachians too, you see a lot of dense fog. But on the flip side, um, in this desert Southwest and Intermountain West, um, you'll very rarely see dense fog conditions. And we'll talk a little bit about why, why that is here in a few slides. So, so we defined fog, what is stratus? And that's, it's basically the same thing. So both of them are low clouds. A stratus cloud is a low uniform sheet light cloud located between the ground level and 6,500 feet. And so fog is basically just a stratus cloud that has reached the ground. So I used to teach a, a lot of spotter training classes in my past job, and I, I kind of equate this to the difference between funnel clouds and tornadoes. It's kind of the same phenomenon. A funnel cloud is, is in the air, and then when it reaches the ground, it becomes a tornado. So it's kind of the same deal here. Stratus cloud, once it reaches the ground, becomes fog. And so before we go and answer our question in detail, Let's, let's just kind of give a foreshadowing for where we're headed here. Um, so, and ask the question, what causes fog in stratus to form? And when you boil it down to its most basic, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you, you, you get fog when atmospheric processes result in one of the following two things happening. You either cool the air to its dew point or you raise the dew point to the air temperature. So you cool the air or you add moisture to the air. That's really, the, as simple as it gets. So let's define a few important parameters that we need to know to understand um, you, how, how the fog and stratus is forming. So the simplest one, temperature, I think probably everyone here has a pretty good intuitive sense for what that means. So it's basically how warm is the air, right? A, a measure of the warmth of the ambient air. And the low level temperature is going to be determined by the relative uh, magnitudes of several different transfers of heat energy. So pretty much all of the, the heat that we have in our um, low level atmosphere is originating from the sun. So the sun's heating the ground through radiation. And then as the ground warms up, it's warming that low level air through conduction. And then as the low level air warms up, it rises through convection. So, you know, warm air rises, cold air sinks, right? And so we've got all of these different kind of counteracting uh, transfers of heat energy. And so the relative balance of these is going to determine what the surface temperature is. So let's think about what happens at night. So all of a sudden, the incoming radiation part of that heat balance disappears. And so we're no longer, we're no longer absorbing sunlight, but we're continuing to emit heat out into the atmos atmosphere through long wave radiation. And so that's why at night our, our surface temperature is cool because we now have much more outgoing heat than we have incoming. And as the ground surface cools, the air cools through conduction again. So one thing that we have to factor into all of this is how does cloud cover impact the amount of incoming and outgoing radiation? And so it's really important uh, for both daytime and nighttime. If we have a lot of clouds during the day, they're going to block a lot of that incoming solar radiation and so prevent the surface from warming up as, white, as much as it otherwise might. But on the flip side, if we have cloud cover at night, that can actually act as sort of a blanket and kind of trap some of that um, outgoing long wave radiation and keep it near the surface. And so that's why you'll often see if we have a lot of low cloud cover, overnight low temperatures are much warmer than they would be on a, on a clear night. And that's because on the clear night, all of that radiation can easily escape out into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's temperature. Now let's look at the other important term here, which is dew point. 
So the meteorological definition of dew point is the temperature to which air must be cooled in order for saturation to occur. So at its simplest, it's basically just a measure of atmospheric moisture. And so the higher the dew point is, the greater the amount of water vapor in the air. And like, like we saw with this graphic I showed a couple of slides ago showing the prevalence of fog, you'll see that there are big differences in dew point temperatures as you go across the country. So a lot of that area that we looked at before in the southwest and intermountain west that rarely sees dense fog um, typically will have some of the lowest dew points in the country. And so those are, are very much related. If you don't have much moisture in the atmosphere, you're not going to have much potential for fog. So let's look at dew point and kind of how, how does it vary through the day? We call this the diurnal trend of dew point. Um, so a lot, during the daytime, we'll often see wind develop and convection start to occur as the surface warms and we start, we start to get that atmospheric mixing. And a lot of times you'll see that the dew point will slowly start to start to lower as that um, mixing increases because we're starting to pull down drier air from, from a loft. And then at night when the wind diminishes and we start to um, see less convective mixing, that all of a sudden allows some of that low level moisture that, that we can get from wet soils from previous rainfall or nearby bodies of water or even a lot of plant um, plants that emit moisture as well. Once we decrease that mixing at night, that low level moisture can start to cool and we'll see dew points start to creep up again. So I, I took a screen capture here of a station in Sacramento, California last week. They were actually in a, in a really good fog pattern out in, in uh, the Central Valley of California last week. And so I just wanted to show um, a graph of temperature and dew point just to kind of illustrate these diurnal trends. So you see temperature obviously tends to increase during the day and then drop off at night. Um, and the, what I really want to point out here is the, the times where we're, we're starting to think about fog and low stratus are these times where the temperature drops down to near the dew point. And so we're going to talk about why that is here in the next couple of slides. But um, just, ju I just wanted to illustrate you know, what a typical diurnal trend looks like for a good fog pattern here. So let's talk about a couple of other um, terms related to low level moisture that you'll frequently hear. So one of them that is, is very commonly used is relative humidity. And basically what that means is it's the percentage of the total amount of moisture present relative to the amount that the air could possibly hold at that temperature. And so looking at that same um, chart for Sacramento that I had on the previous slide, but adding in relative humidity here in green, you can see that in areas where the temperature and the dew point are basically the same, that brings our relative humidity up to 100%. So the air is holding as much water vapor as it possibly can at that temperature. And then when during the day when you see that temperature rise and you've got a difference between your temperature and your dew point, then theoretically you could add more moisture to that air. It could hold more. And so the relative humidity drops. And so here you can see for this particular peak, we've got a relative humidity down around 70%. Um, another term that is often used is dew point depression. And it's very much related to the other terms we've already discussed. So it's, it's the difference between the temperature and the dew point temperature. So basically you take temperature and you subtract your dew point and that's your dew point depression. So in these areas where they're pretty much on top of each other, your dew point depression is gonna be zero. Okay, so now let's talk about how do these different terms that we've um, defined interact to create fog in low clouds. And one example that illustrates it really well that pretty much everyone gets in their intro to meteorology class is the example of pulling a cold, a frosty cold beverage out of your refrigerator. So everyone knows that when you do that, you get water droplets forming on it, right? And that is basically the same process that's happening when fog forms. 
So you take the cold can out and, and it's much colder than the ambient room temperature air. And so the air that's directly adjacent to the can starts to cool down rapidly. And if there's enough moisture in the air, the temperature around the can cools to the dew point and can no longer hold all of the water vapor. And so it starts to condense and change from a gas to a liquid. And so that's basically the same thing that's happening when fog forms. So we've got an animation here, um, the one on the left showing temperature decreasing towards the dew point, and the one on the right is showing dew point increasing towards the temperature. And you can see for both of them, when there's a significant difference between temperature and dew point, there's no visibility restriction. But as they get closer and closer together, you see um, visibility starts to become impacted as water vapor starts to condense into liquid water droplets. And so this typically happens when the difference between the air temperature and the dew point gets down to two to four degrees Fahrenheit is when you'll start to see that happen. Okay, so, so we basically said um, early, at the very beginning of this presentation that in order to create fog, we need to either cool the temperature or increase the moisture content. So let's talk about a few different mechanisms that we can, um, that, that, that can happen. And so on this first slide here, we have a few different ways that we can cool the temperature. So radiational cooling, we've already touched on, is when the surface is emitting radiation into the atmosphere. And so we cool the surface um, air mass as, as that heat is transferred out. And so if we cool the surface temperatures enough to the dew point, then we can get fog that way. Another mechanism is advection of warm air over cool water. So this is something that you'll see pretty frequently in the spring. Um, particularly, you'll notice it over the Great Lakes where the cold water, uh, the w water is still really cold from the winter, but we start to get some of those warmer spring air masses coming in. So as that warm air uh, moves over the cold water, the water cools the air ad directly adjacent to it and you can get fog that way. And then precipitation also will cool the air mass. So if you have a subsaturated layer near the surface, as that liquid water falls through it, some of it is going to evaporate. And evaporation is a cooling process. So as that precipitation evaporates, you'll start to cool the air mass. OK, so now let's look at ways that we can add moisture to the atmosphere. So a sea breeze or an onshore flow, um, like uh, Moist maritime air blowing off the Pacific onto the the west coast. You, you'll see dew points increase significantly when that onshore flow kicks in. Or inland, if you've got some kind of a moisture source like a lake, or even a lot of um, plant life, will will provide water vapor down in the low levels. And solar radiation um, will also evaporate some of that liquid moisture and create water vapor, and so that can be affected down stream and increase the moisture content in the low levels. And then you'll see that precipitation we have again on this slide. So precipitation not only cools the air mass, but also adds moisture, obviously. And so that's why it's often a very effective fog generator, because you're not only cooling, but also moistening the atmosphere at the same time. <clears throat> so You'll see you know, a lot of different names for fog out there. And I, I put some of the most common ones here on this slide. Um, so there's a lot of different names for fog, but they, it pretty much all boils down to situations where the air is either cooled or, the, or moisture is added to the air. Um, so advection fog, we've, we've already covered, where more, more moist air is advected over cool water. There's something called steam fog, which is basically the opposite of the advection fog slide here, where cool air is advected over warm water. And so some of that moisture and warmth from the water is going to mix up into that cold air mass, and you can get some, some shallow fog that way. Um, upslope fog is where moist air travels up and over terrain, and air, as it increases in altitude, cools in temperature due to the decrease in pressure. And so you can generate fog and stratus along terrain um, through that mechanism. 
Radiation fog, we've, we've already covered radiation a couple of times, but again, as, as heat from the low level is low level atmosphere is radiated, radiated out to cool the surface temperature and you can um, generate fog that way. And then precipitation, again, not only cools the air mass, but also moistens it. So you can really get fog quickly with precipitation. Okay, so um, this is my last slide here. Uh, to this point, we've talked about what causes fog in low stratus to form. So now let's just briefly talk about what will lead to dissipation of fog in low clouds. And not surprisingly, it's pretty much the exact opposite of what causes the clouds and, low, and fog. So to dissipate the fog, we either need to increase the temperature or decrease the dew point. And so frequently the way that this happens is that as, you know, as overnight you'll see fog develop. And then as the next day, um, as winds begin to pick up the next day, you'll see that it starts to mix drier, warmer air above the fog layer um, down into the layer. And so you'll, you'll have the fog or stratus layer start to sh become shallower. And at the same time, down at the surface, you'll have increasing convection and also, um, mixing from, from the wind occurring. So you'll actually lift the fog layer. And so it's basically lifting and becoming shallower until it eventually burns off. And the dissipation rate is dependent on a couple of factors. The depth of the fog or stratus layer, so the deeper it is, the longer it's gonna to take to burn off. And also the strength of the wind. So if you have really strong winds, you've got a lot of mixing. So that'll, that'll tend to dissipate the clouds really quickly as well. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Bill, to talk about favorable fog patterns. All right. Thanks, Jeremiah, and uh, appreciate your time tonight. And uh, those, those setups for fog, um, you know, we, we can usually see the whites of its eyes uh, come in well, well ahead of the, the initial development. So um, it, it can certainly happen. Um, on a small scale, it, it's kind of unexpected, but uh, but usually with those uh, reasonable setups, um, you know, the, a forecast will be out and available to you um, to to keep you to keep you informed of, of changing conditions. So uh, we're going to turn it over to Bill here. Let me get my uh, setup adjusted here, and uh, he's going to continue the uh, discussion on fog. And Bill, the controls are yours, sir. I am in control. Do not change your vertical, do not change your horizontal for those of you who are old enough to remember that. <laughs> uh, Bill Cottrell, I'm a meteorologist at AWC. I've been here for about four and a half years. Uh, prior to that, 11 years at Key West WFO um, in a much more tropical environment. Um, can't say I don't miss it. Um, and also, I was at Florida State University for about 10 years as an instructor in the Department of Meteorology. And we're going to kind of add to Jeremiah's presentation, uh, fog and low clouds, uh, but we're going to take it um, maybe a little bit more um, layperson type description. So with the um, changing temperatures, basically, even on a daily basis, the changing temperatures do change the amount of the dew point depression. So in other words, uh, Jeremiah explained that the dew point depression is the difference between the temperature and the actual dew point. And the closer those two are together, the more likely we'll have either stratus or fog developing. So during the day in a typical environment, the temperature's warm because the ground heats up. And then, uh, so with that, the dew point actually mixes out um, and we have a higher dew point depression. So in other words, instead of uh, two to four degrees difference between the temperature and the dew point, it could be up to 10 to 20 degrees difference. And it would take an awful lot of moisture to add to that environment to get us to stratus or fog. At nighttime, temperatures will cool, dew points uh, will sometimes increase, uh, but the temperature will cool closer to the dew point temperature, which reduces the amount of the dew point depression. So in other words, 
the temperature and the dew point come closer together. We can also get seasonal changes, and then we're in one of those seasons where we will see more stratus and fog because we don't get as much heating during the day. So uh, we're, we're looking at uh, the temperatures not increasing, so the dew point depression is pretty much a static uh, environment through the day. The, the great thing that can happen is we can get cloud cover. I have to use the right mouse here. And cloud cover will actually help reduce uh, the potential for fog, but the cloud cover is usually the stratus we have to worry about as well. So the antecedent conditions, uh, snow cover can actually help uh, produce low level moisture and then warm air overrunning that snowfall. Um, uh, post frontal or a warm front comes back over after we get a cold front with a lot of snow and we can get um, intense long lasting fog and stratus. And rainfall also adds low level moisture and increases dew point temperatures. So we don't necessarily need the cooler temperature, we just need to add more moisture and that's what the, the rainfall can do. As for um, a warm front, uh, that's warm air overrunning um, colder air at the surface. This happens a lot along the Gulf Coast. Um, fog and stress from cold wedge underneath the warm frontal boundary. And there could be some precipitation along that front. And then we get IFR going into IMC conditions. Um, also, uh, that warm front can also produce some uh, advection fog where we get fog over the water and not on land as well. So um, we have to watch out for that, especially when we're doing helicopter forecasts for the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Then cold season, cool front, cold front, it's shallow cold air and overrun by warm moist air. So the cold air wedges underneath the warm moist air and pushes it up. That warm moist air starts to cool and the clouds and precipitation also start to form. And we get stratus, especially over the dome of cold air and then maybe fog right along the boundary between the cold and the warm air. And this isn't necessarily long lasting, but it can be uh, detrimental because it will not be static, it will be moving. Um, the overrunning air has colder with the underlying air. The warm fronts and the cold air aloft are the warm air aloft with overrunning the cold air underneath, pardon me. Um, that can give us fog and stress. It doesn't need to have to be any um, precipitation or anything. Uh, it's just, we've got the cold air, especially this time of the year, along the, even into the Great Lakes area, all the way up through the uh, Central Plains and the uh, Midwest. We can get fog, a large area of fog and stratus that develop across the entire area. Um, especially with flow around a high pressure system ahead of a warm uh, cold front that may be moving in from the uh, central plains. And then the return flow, uh, as I was just talking about, we depend on the strength of the subtropical ridge or the, the high pressure and the axis of the warm air can affect very far inland. Um, and then if it gets hung up along a boundary that may be across the um, central United States from, say, Texas all the way across Virginia, um, that presents a, a bigger problem, especially when you start to get into the Appalachians. And then you run into IMC along with terrain, and then uh, that is a very bad situation. Um, the uh, fog and stress over from uh, will form overnight when the surface temperatures cool even more than along just with the boundary. So, what other conditions can affect the stratus formation? So, 
wind generates turbulent mixing and warmer temperatures. Calm or light winds at the surface at night maximize radiational cooling, as Jeremiah was talking about. And I gotta use the right mouse again. And you can see how even if you have um, the fog at the surface, if you have some good radiational cooling aloft, you can still get a nice stratus deck that forms above the fog, um, just because of the mixing of the air aloft. Um, now the cloud cover will re reduce the radiational cooling, but the um, cloud tops or the clouds do um, cause fog top cooling and less radiation is able to escape. And the droplet formation shows and contributes to dissipation. So the bigger the droplets get, the more likely they are to fall out of the atmosphere. So um, new droplets collide with other older droplets and you can get um, more dissipation out of fog and out of the stratus as well. Well, let's see. There we go. Um, so high pressure, you get um, calm winds, clear skies, and that is, um, like Jeremiah said, and, and our presenters before said, in clear skies, you get uh, radiational cooling that lowers the temperature closer to the viewpoint, the viewpoint depression shrinks, and we get fog and stratus, and it can form in that environment. There are other ways that fog and stratus can form as well. Um, low pressure, obviously, uh, when the low is becoming very mature, we get what we call an occluded front. It's The low is filling, and you get this triple point you get a warm front along with the cold front, and then the fog and stratus will develop north of the warm front due to light winds and evaporative cooling or the radiational cooling. And then intensifying lows do not produce the log and uh, the fog and the stratus as well, because usually there's a good amount of wind and mixing with a, a intensifying low. So some other conditions uh, that we'll see fog, uh, local effects, and these uh, photos are courtesy of Michael Billings. Um, he's uh, he's uh, taken pictures of the Missouri River. You can see the convection fog where the wind is coming across the river and picking up the moisture off the river. And so the water temperature was around 62 degrees Fahrenheit. But the, the low temperature with that air moving across the river was 34 degrees. So the colder air running over warmer water, it reached the dew point very quickly. And then the stratus and the fog developed. And you can see how it moved across the, the um, from the one bank to the other. Uh, should I go back? I'm not quite sure how to do that. Um, Anyhow, we will just ignore that. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, you can see how uh, on that um, observation, that METAR, it was um, quite low visibility, quarter mile visibility or quarter mile uh, fog and vertical visibility of less than 100 feet. So it was um, pretty challenging if there was an airport right there, which obviously there was. Um, the other things you can do you know, with this advection fog, I worked a project in 2005 in Costa Rica. At, uh, we were stationed mainly at the Juan Santa Maria Airport in San Juan, Costa Rica. It lies in a horseshoe canyon. We, for about three months before we went to do this project, which was in July, which they call their wet season, um, we were practicing on writing tasks for um, a couple of the NOAA hurricane hunters and, uh, and an ER-2 aircraft, which is uh, basically a U-2 aircraft. It has to fly VFR. There are no instruments on this aircraft. Um, 
even though they fly way above where anybody else would fly. Um, but we thought we had it under control. We were looking at uh, TAFs out of uh, Costa Rica that were calling for CAV OK during the afternoons. And in the afternoons, that just was not the case. In the Horseshoe Canyon, the western edge of that canyon was open to the Pacific Ocean. And every day as, the, um, as San Juan heated up, the air lifted out of the Horseshoe Canyon and was filled in by the marine layer coming in off the Pacific. And there were days where we saw uh, 200 foot ceilings and aircraft coming down so hard to where some of the flight crews were running for cover. So it was quite scary. Um, also, the fog formation, this is a very popular time for folks to fly from, from uh, this area of the country to South Florida. And this is a great time for fog in South Florida, especially um, in the Miami and the Keys and south of Tampa, especially. Um, there's a lot of low level moisture there. The Everglades are there and the water is not very deep. So it responds to cold fronts very quickly. And then um, the warmer air comes back in very quickly and the water takes a little longer to heat up. And so they get fog there quite a bit. I have actually seen fog of one quarter mile visibility in Key West, which is a huge anomaly. Probably 2% of the time, uh, Key West has MVFR and less than 1% of the time has IFR. And this was definitely low IFR and probably not um, useful to fly in. Even um, the airlines would not fly in that. So other conditions that affect stratus formation in addition to temperature, local, local effects, the terrain, as I talked about in San Juan, the surface flux, uh, uh, saturated soil or water like the Everglades, vegetation. Um, we have this thing called evapotranspir evapotranspiration, which is basically uh, plant life giving off uh, water. Um, and then bodies of water, lakes, um, we get lake effect, um, we can get lake effect fog, as well as snow across the Great Lakes. Um, what should pilots be aware of? You need to know the forecast. Um, look at your TAFs, not only at your uh, departure, but at your destination. Uh, get your, um, also uh, get your briefings. Uh, Aviation Weather Center or aviationweather.gov is a great resource for um, graphical forecasts as well as the observations, the TAFs, and SIGMETs, AIRMETs. We have a, a one-stop shot, one shop. Uh, and then as you're going on your flight, make sure you're um, referencing those as you go. Do not uh, just sit back on what you get on your initial uh, information make sure that you're keeping up on it because conditions can change very quickly. Thanks very much. I hope I haven't confused you all too much. All right, well, thank you, Bill. Appreciate your time tonight, sir. And uh, we'll, we're going to wrap it up with Brent. Uh, he is a forecaster uh, just down the road from us in Pleasant Hill. And uh, he's going to be speaking on uh, where you can find uh, IFR forecast information. Brent. Uh, Controls are yours, sir. All righty, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. As Joey said, my name is Brent Peasel. I am a, a meteorologist at the Weather Service in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, uh, which is responsible for uh, the Kansas City area, as well as many forecasts for uh, Central and Northwest Missouri, as well as uh, Far Eastern Kansas. So I want to talk a little bit about where uh, we fit in on the WFO level when it comes to the hierarchy of aviation forecasting and what has happened. Okay, there we go. Uh, must have pressed the wrong button. So where do we fit in as the WFO in the hierarchy of aviation forecasting? Well, we're really concerned with uh, basically the local area around the airfield. Uh, the WFO puts out uh, the terminal aerodrome forecasts uh, or the TAFs, which are 
for around five statue miles from the center of the airfield and probably up to around oh, 10 to 15,000 feet. So we really cover basically your takeoff and your landing. And we also write uh, the aviation discussions as part of our overall uh, discussion uh, product. Stepping up, we go to the Center Weather Service Units and they are located within the FAA uh, Air Route Traffic Control Centers. Uh, and their primary uh, objective is to work with uh, those air traffic controllers uh, in notifying them what weather hazards are ongoing or forthcoming uh, so that they can route uh, aviation and flights around uh, any sort of weather hazards. Uh, you may be more familiar with them uh, as pilots from their uh, center weather advisories. Uh, and then moving up uh, to the next level is the Aviation Weather Center who are responsible for basically very large scale um, weather, uh, aviation weather forecasting. They're known for their outlooks on the icing as well as turbulence. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the air mets as well as sig mets. And they also collaborate uh, with some private partners as far as weather is concerned and are also responsible for some of the overseas routing, particularly uh, between the United States and Europe. So going on to some aviation weather sources, we've talked about a lot of them, uh, including several different apps and several different things like that. I'm gonna focus mainly on what uh, the weather service provides and probably the premier site uh, for weather service forecasts is the Aviation Weather Center for your aviation needs. So where are some sources that we can get IFR observations, things that are ongoing right now? Of course, uh, the METARS uh, is a great way to learn about what current conditions are happening at the airports. It might be a little bit difficult to see on this map, uh, but the METAR page on the, uh, the METAR map on the Aviation Weather Center's page, uh, they color code each of the METARS based on the flight categories uh, that are occurring at the airport. So on this uh, small map here, uh, red dots uh, symbolize uh, IFR, uh, the blue dots symbolize uh, NVFR, and uh, green dots are VFR. So there looks like there's a little bit of a uh, IFR area in eastern Indiana and western Ohio on this map. Another source are our satellite products. Uh, with the newer GO-16, GO-17 satellites that were launched uh, a few years ago, uh, we have been granted a whole new uh, wave of satellite products and different ways we can interpret satellite data. Uh, this particular uh, image is of the nighttime microphysics uh, color band, which enables us, it's an infrared color band that enables us to see the different heights of clouds with more of the yellow and white shades being uh, that of lower clouds and possibly fog, which could lead to IFR conditions. Uh, this particular image comes from uh, CIRA or C-I-R-A. They have a satellite page. You can also find another good satellite page at uh, the College of DuPage at weather.cod.edu. And of course, uh, for precipitation, uh, we have uh, the radars that are located at all the weather most all the weather service offices. Uh, if you do know how to uh, look at higher tilts of the radar, say you have uh, Virga, which is just precipitation not reaching the ground, you can look at those higher tilts as well and see if maybe you'll be encountering some elevated precip as uh, you leave or enter your destination. Uh, one of our favorites, of course, are the pilot reports. We love our pilot reports. Uh, they help us verify uh, that uh, the activities that are actually going on or the weather conditions that are actually out there are what we have forecasted. Uh, basically gives us verification uh, that what we think is happening is actually happening. And it can also help us update forecasts as needed if conditions change. We know as you're flying conditions change uh, very rapidly sometimes. So pilot reports always help us out. So flipping from uh, ongoing IFR conditions to IFR forecasting, uh, there are several products that are issued by uh, these offices that uh, can help with that. Uh, the first one being uh, the TAFs, the Terminal Aerodrome Forecast. These are issued uh, at the weather forecast office level and uh, each line denotes usually a change in conditions, generally a change in category or a significant change in wind direction or speed. Uh, this one is for uh, North Platte, Nebraska. Looks like it was issued around uh, 2Z. And as we can see, 
overnight, it looks like we are expecting some IFR conditions to move in with one and a half statute miles, uh, fog with overcast at uh, 300 feet. Uh, also noting that it looks like it's going to be rather gusty, so it may not be the nicest night to fly into North Platte this particular night. In tandem, we also have uh, the forecast discussions, which are available on every WFO webpage. Uh, there is an aviation section, generally uh, towards the bottom of that discussion page, and using the aviation discussion in tandem with uh, the TAFs can give you a really good picture of what to expect uh, over the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, generally, the aviation discussions are used to kind of give you a behind the scenes look as to what I, the forecaster, am thinking uh, when the TAFs are issued. So for example, if I'm working on the 18Z or in this case noon TAFs, uh, and I'm seeing in the models that um, maybe we could be seeing some uh, potential fog development uh, the following morning, uh, you know, the, the guidance may not be super confident, but it is hinting at that possibility. So I will probably keep it out of the actual TAF for the time being, because of course the TAF is mainly concerned. We're mainly put our focus on the first six hours uh, and then fill out the rest of the period. Um, but I might go into the discussion and mention that uh, guidance is short term guidance is suggesting that uh, there is a potential for fog development overnight. Uh, there's a bit of inconsistency between the guidance, so confidence is a little low in that fog development. Uh, this will be updated in future TAFs. So oftentimes, reading those discussions, uh, you can get a good view into the forecaster's brain into uh, how they came up uh, with that forecast. And of course, on a much bigger level, we have uh, the Sierra Aramets from the Aviation Weather Center, which mainly focus on uh, ceiling and visibility uh, hazards. Uh, for example, in this uh, map that is shown, uh, we see a large uh, IFR area due to uh, fog over the central plains. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Uh, for those who want to be more involved in their uh, weather analysis, uh, we do have a special suite of models that focus on aviation variables, and they are called uh, the LAMP models are the localized aviation MOS program. And uh, these are available via the uh, model development lab or the MDL. And there are so many variables over this that I'm not going to be able to cover them uh, in the time that we have tonight. But I'll just talk about two of the main ones. Uh, they do probability graphics. So this graph that is on display now uh, is showing the probability of ceiling heights less than uh, 3,000 feet at uh, Kansas City International. Uh, and so the areas that are coded in red show a high chance of those ceilings uh, going below those thresholds, and uh, the bluer colors show less of a chance. Uh, in the bottom right is the actual text display, uh, if you want to get into the actual text output of the models. And mainly what uh, you as pilots are going to be concerned with are the areas in the box, uh, which go over your weather type, uh, the cloud coverage, the ceiling, uh, as well as the visibility and any other observations. And it is worth noting that when you are looking at these, that the uh, numbers that are presented there are actually the flight categories. They're not like uh, the height. So when it says uh, ceiling of six, that means flight category six, not uh, 6,000 feet. Okay, it's not advancing, there we go. Uh, another great source, the, probably the best source for uh, your IFR uh, forecasting, and this has been discussed at length throughout this presentation, has been the graphical forecasts for uh, aviation. Uh, it is basically a gridded display of aviation forecasts around uh, the country. You can impose your uh, flight plan on there, so put in your starting airport, your destination airport, it will show you the flight plan. Uh, there's a little bar up in the top right of that display where you can advance time and see how those uh, weather variables advance across uh, the area or across your flight path. Um, and you can get just about any sort of aviation variable or forecast that you want uh, within 
uh, the graphical forecast for aviation is a very good tool to use. So there are some other sources outside the Aviation Weather Center as well. If you're looking for uh, high resolution surface maps, uh, the Weather Prediction Center puts out multiple maps a day that are very good uh, for determining the location of highs and lows and fronts and troughs and ridges and other things. And uh, depending on how uh, high off the ground you are flying, the Storm Prediction Center uh, does upper air analysis uh, twice a day. And uh, you know, depending on the direction that you're flying, the jet stream and uh, especially a low level jet can really affect um, your uh, flight pattern. So they're also a very good resource as well. And then one more resource for you uh, that you may not know about uh, is the uh, National Weather Service Weather and Hazards Data Viewer. This is a site that allows you to look at uh, METARs in a very big, a very good detail. Allows you to look at uh, ASOS sites and surface observations. It'll also show you hazards and temperature and a whole lot of other things. But uh, for pilots and the aviation crowd, what I think you'd be most interested in uh, are the ASOS um, archives and uh, data in there. Um, when you click on a station, the display that's shown on the right side of the slide will show up and it'll give you the past observations. And the one that you'd most likely be interested in is you can access five minute observations uh, within uh, this interface. Uh, so a lot of times the uh, METARs up, update every hour. Many times uh, the METARs will update with special statements and things uh, during any active weather. Uh, but say, you know, that doesn't happen and you're flying into, uh, let's say, Olathe at 7.45 with the 7 p.m. Uh, METAR says uh, that there's a thunderstorm uh, with gusty winds and uh, you're looking on your radar and your other apps uh, apps and other sources of information and uh, it doesn't look like there's any rain there you can go into this uh, website and get the five minute observations to get the absolute latest uh, update so uh, that's all i have i want to thank uh, joey and scott and everyone at the awc for letting me come out and uh, i will be around for questions uh, but uh, at this time i'm going to turn it back over to joey all right. Well, thank you, Brent. And uh, I uh, want to uh, let everyone know that if you are interested uh, in becoming a Weather Ready Nation ambassador, uh, we have a, uh, some source information down there at the bottom, uh, weather.gov uh, forward slash WRN. Uh, that will take you to the Weather Ready Nation website uh, for more information. And basically, it's, it's a, an initiative to, to inform and protect uh, everyday citizens um, in schools, businesses, uh, aviation, uh, any any enterprise uh, that that contends with weather, uh, which is most in some fashion. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, as we've discussed tonight, there's a lot of unknowns uh, with with weather hazards, and um, you know we we have the information to to educate and uh, inform and um, to be a Weather Ready Nation ambassador is to, to, to take part in that and then to share that information with others to, to keep them safe as well. So feel free to visit that website uh, for more information regarding that. Um, we wanna send a big thank you to, to all of our presenters tonight, uh, especially our guest presenters. And um, if, you, if you have any uh, questions, uh, feel free to submit those in the chat. Uh, Scott, do we have any questions that were uh, unaddressed uh, during, the, during the course of the presentation? All right, hi, Joey, sorry about that. Um, honestly, I, I think we got to a lot of the questions, um, but I can kind of go back over some others because I'm sure some in the group would be be interested in some of the conversation that we're having on, on the chat. Um, I, I guess first and foremost, one of the, the biggest questions uh, is kind of a housekeeping item. The, uh, the presentation is being recorded um, and we will follow up with a, a survey in the coming days. Um, uh, as well as as an email that will include that YouTube link. So it'll take some time to get the pro the uh, the video edited. So look for that video uh, to be uploaded to AWC's YouTube page by early next week. And then um, also along those lines, um, 
you will receive WINGS credit for this. Uh, we've already got your information through GoToWebinar, so we'll send in the information, uh, your email address uh, to the FAST folks to, to be able to get you WINGS credit for that. And some of the other questions uh, that we're getting, a really good discussion here as, as of late um, uh, regarding some of the, the slides that Brent shared um, with respect to the difference with the TAF and the forecast discussion. Oftentimes the TAF is a, is, um, a deterministic forecast or so we're forecasting one thing, um, whereas we're not allowed to include probabilities for that. So the, the way that we handle low confidence forecasts, say you're issuing the zero Z TAF um, for MCI, but you're you're not very confident about the uh, the possibility of, of morning ground fog or uh, radiation fog. So you could, for zero Z, you could in, enter a tempo and, and maybe cover some MVFR fog uh, developing after 9Z, um, but really by 6Z, maybe you'd have a little bit more conf confidence to make that a, a prevailing group. Um, but kind of the way that we handle lower confidence is, is definitely in that forecast discussion. Um, so it, it's always good to supplement the, the TAP with that forecast discussion. Uh, the people at the, the forecasters at the WFOs like, like Brent are, are really on top of that. Uh, they like to include that, that um, uncertainty in that discussion. So always be sure to check that out as well. Um, some of the other questions, uh, one was, um, how can I avoid accidentally flying into clouds at night? And really with what Brent shared with that uh, nighttime microphysics um, satellite, College of DuPage, their satellite page is, is excellent. Um, so before you fly, if you wanna check that out, uh, weather.cod.edu, um, you can look at that nighttime microphysics um, and kind of be able to see where the IFR, if, if it's advection like Jeremiah was talking about or Bill, uh, you can kind of see the low ceilings advecting into your area. Um, or just simply infrared, you can kind of see that dark white um, on the infrared uh, to kind of give you an idea of, of um, developing IFR conditions. Uh, but honestly, just keeping an eye on the METARs is, is kind of the best way to go because you're going to start to see maybe uh, MIFG, some, some ground fog developing or, or visibility is dropping to six miles and then maybe three to five before uh, dropping even more. Um, or if it's stratus, you could see if 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 it's kind of move if it's VFR and then it's kind of developing into uh, to IFR conditions, you can kind of see in the the METARs that that ceiling starts to sag slowly downward toward the ground. Or if it develops, you'll start to see uh, maybe a few uh, fewer scattered at 400 feet or fewer scattered at 800 feet uh, before it becomes broken or overcast and come becomes that true IFR conditions. Uh, so that's definitely something that you you can keep an eye on. Uh, oftentimes, the METAR trends are, are a great thing to follow, especially if you're in the air, you're, you're listening to the OBS uh, over ADSB or over um, the VORs or things like that. That's a great way to, to get that information. Um, another question was, uh, biggest concerns are winds. What weather products can I use to best inform my decisions to depart? Um, and know what the wind is going to be on my way home. You know what is the best forecast product for that? Hands down, uh, GFA. Uh, the graphical forecast for aviation is is your go-to for anything, especially within 12 to 15 hours. Uh, the link for that aviationweather.gov/gfa. The 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 great thing about it is when you go to wind on the GFA. On the left side, you're gonna have a column that you can stair step up through 3,000, 6,000, 9,000, all the way up to 38, I think 39,000 for wind speeds. Um, and at those levels, you can easily slide through the hours um, going in the future, or if you want to, there's an observation uh, part as well on the GFA that you can actually go back 12 hours to look at the winds or the METARs or uh, radar satellites. So that's some great helpful information there as well. If you're looking for something a little bit more in depth in the GFA, we've got the wind and temperature aloft, and the link to that is simply uh, aviationweather.gov uh, slash wind temp. Uh, so that's another resource we have as well. Um, let me look through here, see if we've got a few other questions. I know we're, we're kind of long on time. Uh, let's see. Oh, there was one question. It was interesting, the, the tap that Brent shared, um, 
it was showing IFR conditions, but it was showing fog with strong winds. So that was an interesting case. I, I pulled that one just for that reason alone. So I'm glad that you, some of you caught that, uh, that you've got IFR and fog in, in uh, really gusty condition. I think wind gusts were up to 20, 25 miles per hour. And simply what that was doing is what Jeremiah was talking about that was increasing the dew point, a uh, nice strong southerly southeasterly flow, raising that dew point uh, temperature was dropping just enough that you still had um, some terrain effects in there as well, some, some upslope that helped that condense, uh, that moisture condense and actually create a relatively long IFR conditions with, with strong winds. Uh, it was mostly ceilings, but there were actually some IFR visibilities in there as well. And I think that terrain component really helped with that as well. Um, so that was that was a great catch. Um, let's see. And then another question here, what do trough lines really tell you on the surface chart? Um, what are we concerned with with uh, regarding a surface trough? I just simply think as a surface trough uh, as a cold front. Basically, it's going to be a wind shift. Um, but not as strong. You know, you're not going to have the strong gradients in temperature or the strong gradients in, in dew point per se, uh, but definitely there's some surface forcing going on there, enough of a shift in the winds uh, that you can get some low level lift. So that's what generates that surface trough line um, on the prog charts. And then um, how about uh, just one more, if I can find one. Um, there was a question uh, regarding Let's see, the 11 o'clock news uh, talking about morning fog, but it not being in the taps. That simply may be because of motorists are looking for a different threshold than pilots. You know, pilots are looking for this, the MBFR conditions of three to five statute miles um, dropping down the IFR. So it, it's kind of easy for the news media that, that they can warn motorists of, of ground fog, shallow ground fog. It's, it's going to be an impact for vehicles. Um, but it's, it's really, aviation is kind of a different beast when it comes to forecasting. So that's kind of why you may hear a mention uh, on the newscast about some, some morning fog, uh, but sometimes maybe maybe around the airport it's, it's dry or they didn't get the rain the night before. So sometimes um, it might not drop to MBFR, especially to, to IFR. So that kind of, that might be part of the reason for the difference. And that's that's kind of when I encourage you to just go ahead and go back to that forecast discussion and kind of see the, the differences there. And let's see, I think, I think I maybe, maybe talked enough. It's, it's after eight central standard time. So um, if you had any more questions in the chat, we'll get to those. Uh, we'll get you emailed. We've got your contact information, so we won't, we won't leave you hanging. And I'm going to, Thank you, Scott, for uh, fielding those questions. I'm going to ask all of our presenters, if you're still here, uh, to come back on camera one more time as we uh, close. Uh, again, we want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I know it's it's evening and it's a busy time of year, but we appreciate your time. I uh, hope you have a great Thanksgiving and, uh, and stay safe this winter season. Uh, the hazards are real and they will be present um, for motorists and pilots. Uh, so, so stay safe. Um, Scott, you may have mentioned there, there will be a survey coming, um, so yes. keep an eye out for that. And also, we're going to post this entire session on YouTube uh, within the next week, so keep an eye out for that too. If you had to step out or if you want to reference it uh, some other time, uh, it will be available for you. So if anything, if anybody has anything else they want to add, uh, feel free to. Otherwise, uh, we'll probably do another one of these in the spring time frame. Scott's shaking his head. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that notification. Does anyone have anything else? Uh, just a huge thank you to Paul and Mark for joining us tonight. This was great. Thank you both. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all, uh, presenters and uh, and attendees. Have a have a great night and a uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. <laughs>